James, chapter 5. We're going to continue our study in the book of James. What? A favorite part of James was good. Uh, I'm going to read verse 1 and then I'm going to ask some questions. It says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Now this phrase, go to now, uh, we don't talk that way anymore. And that's why some people don't like King James. And so if you got the NIV or something else, it may have a different phrase. But basically it's saying this, you need to stop and take a look and evaluate your philosophy about something, what you think, how you handle and deal with. And because the original uh, Bible, uh, the New Testament, didn't have chapter breaks and verse breaks, that was added later for convenience of finding things, it's continuing the theme about walking humbly before God, and it's going to look at the subject of money and possessions with that, now I want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, what do most people spend most of their time trying to do during their life? And what you will find is this. Most people are trying to accumulate money and wealth. And they do so for a lot of different reasons. And so, in looking at this biblical uh, questioning of take a look, stop, and think about how you view money and how you handle these type things to make sure you're not walking in pride. If you want to be honest, most people look to money the way people should look to God. Money's going to protect me from getting sick, but it won't. Money's going to help me find somebody who will love me forever, but it won't. Money's going to help me uh, be a big somebody and be a success, but it won't. The old saying uh, that if uh, life is about he who dies with the most toys wins, but he still dies. And so... A lot of people look to insurance and buying this and that to protect them and to do all types of things in life for them. And this section of Scripture is causing you to stop and say, do I look at money to do for me what only God can do for me and I've got a wrong mindset toward possessions? That's why it says in verse 1, hey, stop, look, you rich men. Now, I ain't checking your bank accounts, but not too many people in here would qualify probably in their minds as rich men. But I will tell you this. Riches is not about the amount of stuff you have. The Bible says if you have for what you need for a day to be content, if you have above that, you are blessed. And I will tell you this. If you look at the wealth in the world you would qualify as rich. But more importantly, it's this idea of wanting money. It's this idea of wanting possessions as a way to protect you in life, a way to make your life worth living, to find joy and pleasure in life. People think they have to have money to do all that. Only God can give the joy and the peace and the things that you're looking for in life. And so it says... Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come. Now, what do you mean by that? All right? If you would put up Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let that sink in. Um, and then I'm going to, I'll read the rest of it, and then I'll go back and hit certain points. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if the eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. 
He'll either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And here's the ending part. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is a word in Scripture that, that covers riches, possessions. But it also, I want you to understand, mammon is a spirit, a demonic spirit, that is there to cause you to look to things to replace what only God can do. So if you would go back to the first part of these verses, and I want to go through and break them down. Does this mean it's wrong to have a bank account and a savings account? No. It is absolutely not wrong for you to understand that God wants you to have savings. But it's the attitude. It's the attitude of, I am laying up treasures for me, my precious, if you've seen um, Lord of the Rings. My precious. You love money. The Bible says the love of money. I, I sound raspy, don't I? <clears throat> Drink some, okay. Only a wife would say that, all right. Drink it, my little one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. If you make money and possessions what your life is about, about accumulating more and more and more and more things, that it's about building up bigger and bigger. God's Word says you are always going to live in fear and anxiety because there is a decaying element about money. I don't know about you, but as quick as I get it, it goes out the other door. <laughs> Scripture says in Ecclesiastes, the more stuff you got, the more headaches you got. It talks about in Ecclesiastes where uh, if you've got multiple things, you can only lie in one bed at a time. If you got 18,000 cars, you can only drive one at a time. And you can only enjoy so much at a time. And as Forrest Gump says, Mama said, the rest is just for showing off, which is pride. And so we're called to not see money as something we are supposed to accumulate more and more and more and more and more about as a protection against evil and as a way to make our life full and meaningful. It says, but lay <clears throat> up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and thieves do not break through and steal. I want you to understand the reason that you need to check your philosophy about money is money is a tool to lay up eternal treasure. Let that sink in. Think about that. Money is a tool to lay up an eternal treasure. You say, no, I need money to buy groceries. Well, do you know the Bible says whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I can go to McDonald's, and I was going to say cheeseburger, but I like the McRibs. It's, they're, they're here this season. I can get a McRib and my fries and a, and a drink, and I can eat that in a way that glorifies God and therefore lays up an eternal reward for me because I am eating and drinking to God's glory. The Bible says you can do anything to God's glory. And so in this idea of accumulating things, there's nothing wrong. God gives you money to meet your needs, to have a house, to have cars, and even if you have a boat, as long as you let your pastor drive. You know, I'm, now I'm picking. Uh, these things are okay to have. Some of the richest people that have ever walked the face of the earth have also been the most godly people. But they did not let the possessions possess them. They understood that possessions were a blessing from God, an expression of His love to use to His honor and glory. So I want to add, <clears throat> I'll take another one. I'm more interested in preaching as long as I can get it out. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, plus it disrupts my, my train of thought. And it's a very small train, so it's tough to get back on. <laughs> but anyway, that's why you should take a look at your philosophy of money. Do you accumulate in the things that you have? Do you ask God this question? God, why have you given me this? How can this be used to your honor and glory? How can this be used to bless others? How can this be turned into eternal value? We do not take up an offering at this church 
so that I can make more money or so that we can pad the pews better or have golden faucets in the bathrooms. or that. And I'm not against nice buildings and those things as God blesses. There's nothing wrong with that depending on the motive of the heart. But if we have gold-plated knobs, it should be because we believe those gold-plated knobs would reach somebody for Jesus Christ, would point to His glory, His goodness, His blessing. This idea of prosperity gospel has gotten a hold of the church where they, don't, they think if you're not got all this bling bling and ching ching that you can rub in the world's faces to say, hey, I'm blessable. God's given me all this stuff so you didn't just stick it where the sun doesn't shine. There's something of pride in that. There's something in a lack of understanding. We are supposed to be laying up Treasures in heaven. Because you know what? That's where it can't be touched. Once it's, once it's deposited in the bank of heaven, no robber can get it. No way I can spend it away. It is there for me to eternally enjoy. The rewards that God gives for faithfulness and obedience with our possessions are eternal rewards. You never begin to say, I have to subtract from my bank account. I've used that up. It's not that way. Twin, verse 21 so challenging. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's why we're not reaching a world for Jesus Christ. Do you know how many good things that God is doing that need money? Now you say, well, if it needs money, why doesn't God supply? He did. He gave it to His people. And they're spending it on things that have no eternal value. They're spending it out of pride. They're spending it out of fear. They're spending it to do for them what only God can do. And they do not view their possessions as a tool to produce eternal riches. And so, moving on, it says in... Uh, well, let me go back to this to explain this and I'll get back to James. This part, you say, what is this, the light of uh, the eye? The body is the eye. And if the eye is single, where your focus is, what's your focus? It's saying uh, with your eye, if your eye is focused on a certain thing, then you're not distracted by these other things. And if you're focusing that my possessions are to be used to the glory of God for eternal value, then God says that lights up the whole of everything you possess. But if you do not understand that your possessions are for that reason, you're, you think it's about me having what I need. Because if I don't have this or this that I can see and touch and feel or, or write a check for out of my bank account, then, then I'm in danger. You live in fear. You live in making mammon your God. And there's darkness in your life. And you spend your life trying to accumulate stuff and are laying hardly anything, if anything, up for the eternal riches. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart be also. So what is your view of stuff? You go, if... Next verse. If therefore the light sit in the... Then it comes... Serving two masters... Can I tell you, you can't straddle the fence on this issue. You know what happens when you straddle the fence? You get blisters and splinters in your butt. Quite uncomfortable. Doesn't help anybody. God's Word basically says this. You can't have a, well, I'll sort of have this idea of philosophy. God says it's an all-in thing. Your eye has to be single if it's going to be full of life. You cannot serve God and have a wrong understanding about why God has given you what He's given you. Or you will be under a demonic spirit that influences and robs you in this life and in the next. Now back to James, second verse. Your riches are corrupt and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped up treasure together for the last days. 
Do you know everything in this world is going to be burned up? The only thing that's eternal is the Word of God and the souls of men. And if you are not investing in the Word of God and the souls of men, you are wasting your time. It's going to be burned up. If you would then uh, go to the Luke 16, 9 to 13. <clears throat> now this seems that the Bible is contradicting itself, but I want you to understand a biblical principle. If two verses in the Word of God don't seem like they can both fit together, you don't understand one of them or both of them correctly. So the verse that I'm going to read you looks a little strange. It says, And I say unto you, Make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. If you don't understand that, there's a little parable that he gives before that about this guy who was an unjust steward and he was going to get kicked out of his job. And so what he did, he got what he could from the debts that were owed even, and cut them in half. He did what he could. And in this principle of make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, he said, listen, money and possessions in and of themselves have no eternal value. But he says, make friends with that. What does he mean by that? You should want to accumulate as much stuff as you can as long as you're going to use it for the kingdom. I'll give you a truth. I'm getting old. You say, I already knew that. That isn't a truth. It's a new thing to me. Well, I'm getting old. But you know what? Jenny's going to be in college, and by the time I'm 70, she's going to be out of college. But from 70 to 80, I intend to quit driving a school bus at 80. And um, if they'll have me, uh, and trust me, they'll have me because they need school bus drivers all the time. Why am I going to do that? Number one is I want to be able to provide some things for my, my children, my grandchildren. But more importantly, I'm going to drive that bus for 10 years, and in that 10 years, if they don't cut my salary, uh, I'll be able to accumulate $100,000. And the majority of that is going to go to the work of the Lord. Now, taking care of my family, my children, my grandchildren is the work of the Lord. So it's all going to the work of the Lord. But as long as God gives me help in a way that I can do it, I'm going to accumulate as much stuff as I can. I want you to know, every job that I've ever taken since I got out of college, I've had to take a cut and pay to go there. And yet God has provided, house paid for, vehicles paid for, except for educating kids, really don't have any big things in front of us as long as God gives us help. That's a blessing of God. Money can't buy that. Obedience to God with the possessions that you have. God is going to give me strength. God is going to give me grace so that I can accumulate things to advance His kingdom and turn into eternal value. Is that your attitude toward money? Make friends with um, unrighteous mammon. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you've not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, if you've not been faithful with the possessions that God has given you, why do, should he give you anything more so you got a bigger idol in your life? And the ones that you do have become a headache and a curse in your life. And if we get to it today, I'll show you that from Scripture. Who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No man, servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one, love the other, or else he'll hold to the one, despise the other. Here we are again. You cannot serve God and money. In this dynamic, why should God bless this church with seeing people saved and seeing people grow in the Lord and people finding out their gifting and begin serving the Lord if we can't even handle money right. 
If we're accumulating money so we can build a bigger this or have a nicer that, and I'm not against a bigger this or a nicer that, as long as our desire in doing that is to serve Jesus Christ, to promote Him, not the pride of look what we've done, look what we've accomplished, look at how all we're doing. That's pride and that's sin and God can't bless it. And the church of Jesus Christ in America is riddled with it. Riddled with it. Um, next verse. Uh, Luke 12, uh, 16 through 21. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful, and he brought thought within himself, saying, What am I going to do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to myself, So, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Because after all, that's what possessions can do. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. I want to ask you, how much stuff do you have stored in your attic and it's been there for 15 years and you've not done anything with it but you keep it thinking that you're going to use it one day? How many clothes do you have in your closet that you don't wear, don't like and you keep buying more? I tell my wife all the time, I'll put on something because me and you understand this. You're a woman's Ken doll. So I'm Donna's Ken doll. She's my Barbie and I, I, I like her. But anyway, I'm her Ken doll and she wants to dress me up. And I'll put something on and she'll say, I always ask her because I'm not as dumb as I look. Sweetheart, what do you want me to wear? Oh, I don't care. Oh, I know better, but I have to put on something. So I go in our clothes, and clothes I put on, come out. And she said, that's terrible. That looks ugly. Take that off. I said it this morning about a tie I put on. And I said, I didn't buy this. Got it from somebody else. So either you or somebody else got it for me. My closet has all types of stuff in it I never wear. She probably wouldn't even let me wear. And this, this scripture has really challenged me more and more about what do I have. People rent Storage buildings to put stuff in that they don't use for years and years and years. Somebody's got to be able to use that. And we need to be able to bless in Jesus' name. Uh, years ago at this church when it was smaller and a little easier to do, we, we had a, a building and we said anything that you want to get rid of, bring. And anybody that wants it can, can get it. We tried to do a swap and exchange thing. I think that's a great ministry if somebody would want to take it up to find out, what do you got? You got two tires that are still good on all right and then you've got this and this and and try to make sure people get it but my point is this we have a tendency to just accumulate stuff rather than have a how can i use this for the kingdom's sake mentality going on um um so surplus, uh, the, the spiritual principle, I wanted you to see this. When God gives you surplus, if your needs are met and the responsibility of the needs are met that you have responsibility for, and that includes savings, if you still have surplus, guess why God gave you that surplus? It wasn't to build bigger barns. It was to, God, you've given me this surplus to bless and serve you. One of the challenges I have with this church, God's blessed and we've been a giving church and God's blessed us and, and we have money in the bank and we're waiting to see if God allows us to outgrow this building but part of me also prays, Lord, if you want this money to go somewhere right now, having, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in the bank, I don't want that. I want to see it turned into eternal value. Why have you given us this money? And we have that responsibility. Um, going on, salvation. You cannot serve two masters. Uh, go, if you would, put up the um, Matthew. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? 
Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I don't know who here is saved and who's not. I only know for sure about me the rest of your educated guesses. But there may be somebody here that is caught up in the world's mentality. When you come to your deathbed, I've been around as a minister many people who have, have been on deathbeds. And you know not one of them looked at me and said, I wish I had made more money. Not one of them. And I want you to know that when you come to the end of life and you think that this life is about money, it's not. Now I'm going to click to those of us who do know Jesus Christ and because of the culture and, and things, I use movies a lot. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Schindler's List, but it was about the man who was trying to rescue the Jews and stuff. And if you remember at the end of the movie, he's looking at his watch and he's crying and he's saying, this watch, I could have gotten ten more Jews out of the concentration camp. And he saw that all that he accumulated, what it could have done in saving a soul, but he had to have a nicer watch. And it was eating him alive. The Bible says that when we come to, as Christians, what's called the beam of seat judgment, we will not be judged for sin, but we will be rewarded for obedience. But we're going to see where God has put resources in our hands that He could have turned into eternal value in souls that would have gotten us an eternal reward for it. And we squandered it for a bigger this or a fancier that. And once again, there's nothing wrong with stuff. It's about the attitude of your heart. Are we going to cry and say, Lord, 18 more people could have been discipled better in this ministry. This ministry could have done more of helping people who are in sex trafficking or get people out of drug abuse or whatever. Are your resources about seeing souls changed? Because what are you going to give in exchange? What would you be willing to pay to see somebody saved? If God said, Dwayne, tell you what, I've, I've got a, a, a new thing I'm doing, which God would never do that. He said, I'm putting a price tag, and if for every $100,000 that you're able to raise, I will save a soul of your choice. How hard would you be working? <coughs> or would you say, you know, you know, I, I got to take care of me and I want this and I want to do that and I want to... I'm praying for uh, our sweet uh, exchange student, uh, Julia, who y'all know that have been here, was with us last year, praying for her salvation. And if it took my home and my cars and my bank account if I knew that that would equate into her salvation, God can have it. Is that your attitude towards your possessions? Or do your possessions possess you? Uh, there's more to this service, but uh, I've always been told the uh, brain can only take in what the... I think you've had plenty to think about and evaluate along these lines. But please, please... Go to now. Take a moment. Take this time as a challenge from God and His Word and His Spirit to say what is your mentality toward possessions and money and what the accumulation of this stuff is about. And if you need to do business with God, do business with God. I don't care whether you come forward or not. If He tells you to come forward, come forward. If He says do it in your seat, if He says go out in the parking lot, do it. You obey God. But do business with God. We're not playing games. Eternal things hang in the balance. Let's pray.